Hello, I uh, welcome once again to Marijuana Resolve. Uh, we are today taping at the BCTV studios in downtown Brattleboro. Uh, today we have as our guest two uh, long-term activists. Um, Larry Block has, uh, is an, a long-term marijuana and hemp activist, uh, and he is the uh, the founder and uh, an owner of, a, and was in fact, I'm sorry, I, I mean to say, of the uh, Wetlands Preserve in New York City. Uh, and when he came to Vermont, he ultimately opened a store here called Save the Corporations from Themselves. Um, and uh, he has, uh, he's had the activist addict and quite a bit of background in both the issues of marijuana and hemp. Uh, Eric Lineback is the treasurer and co-founder of Vote Hemp, a national organization that works uh, with, um, with different groups as well as trying to help change the laws in, in, in the United States. And Eric is a Vermont local who works with the Vermont State Legislature. Gentlemen, welcome. And I'm glad to see you both here today. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Vinny. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of things to talk about and for, for really such a short program. So why don't you begin with just giving us an update on what you uh, know about what's been happening in the legislature here. We can start with that. Sure, thanks. First, I want to say, Larry, uh, uh, wonderful job with all the work you did at the Wetlands Preserve. Uh, you happened to mention that, Vita, and uh, long ago I did an event that happened several years there called the Hemp Radius Jam back when the whole hemp industry was re-emerging in the mid-90s and we had a bunch of successful events there and raised a lot of awareness and uh, it was, it's great that Larry and I have sort of ended up coming full circle uh, here in Brattleboro, Vermont. So That's awesome. Uh, great work with that, with that project, Larry. Um, so quick update on, on the hemp situation here in the United States. We've had a federal bill uh, in play for the last uh, seven, eight years now uh, there have been four bills starting in 2005, and they each have rolled over to the second year of the session, and we're now on our fourth uh, going into the second year here. It's uh, H.R. Uh, 1836, which is the uh, Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2011. It was introduced last year by Ron Paul, who's currently still running for president. Uh, and like the previous three bills, that bill has basically been stuck in, in committee, uh, went to the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee and Subcommittee on Health and went to the uh, Judiciary Committee and ended up in the uh, Subcommittee on uh, Crime, Terrorism and Homeland Security, of all things. So uh, clearly this, then that's sort of a, a good example of how the hemp issue, hemp subject has been looked at by uh, governments around the, the country, particularly our federal government, as being a, a drug issue, a, a, a crime, uh, terrorism, and homeland security issue. Uh, not once has the bill ever received a hearing in all four attempts here, and it just basically ends up in committee and gets, gets stuck there. So uh, I guess the one bit of good news this year um, with, with this fourth try at the federal level is that we have more co-sponsors than ever before, and each, each year it's been steadily uh, growing, um, but that number is still relatively small. Uh, including Ron Paul, there are 34 co-sponsors this year. Uh, and, and a little bit of a, a side note, the nine of those folks, including Ron Paul, because he's running for president and not going to be running for re-election in the House, uh, so including Ron Paul and eight others uh, are leaving for one reason, either they're not running again, they already, percentage, for example, already uh, in Ohio already got beaten in the primary, and um, others are, uh, are just not, are moving on to other things, running for other office, et cetera. So, so we're gonna be back down to 25 friends in the house, and, um, but you know, hopefully we're very confident we'll find someone to be the primary sponsor and get another bill going in the next session. So uh, that's that. At the state level, we had uh, seven states uh, taking action this year, including Vermont, so we're going to see how that all plays out as the legislative sessions all come to an end. Here in Vermont, I'll spend a couple minutes on what happened there, and that is uh, sort of at the last minute here, a, um, the Senate uh, Economic Development Committee basically decided, Vince Aluzzi uh, decided to 
uh, write an amendment that he would attach to some bill, and it ultimately ended up being attached because this was so late in the session and there really weren't many options for him. Uh, it was attached to uh, H747, which was a, a cigarette tax bill, essentially. Um, and that had come out of the House successfully. He added the amendment in the Senate. It passed out of the Senate as written with that amendment, and then it had a little trouble in the House when it went back to the House. But ultimately, with some compromising, we did get an amendment through, and I'll go in, uh, I guess a little later, I'll go into some of the details of what that means, but Vermont essentially has been, has had a law in the books here, Act 212, um, for four years now, since uh, 2008. That was a two-year effort, 07, 08, to get that through. And basically it, it legalized hemp, but the permitting process was held up by the fact that it needed to be triggered by one of several things. And the bottom line, the federal government needed to, to take some action to either redefine hemp or change the law or the DEA, the administration would have to uh, clarify that hemp is separate from marijuana. So Vermont would not, was not able to, uh, uh, you know, Chuck Ross, uh, agriculture secretary, not able to write the rules basically to then issue permits. So sort of been sitting there effectively doing nothing for, for four years now. This amendment was supposed to remove those restrictions and, and let that process move forward. The compromise that was reached was to basically allow them to write the rules, but then to not issue, be able to issue any permits until one of those three triggers was triggered. So we're still sort of in this, gonna be in the same spot, not being able to issue permits to farmers, but at least we're now gonna get one step closer and have the regulations in place. Hopefully uh, our, our goal is to work with, with uh, with Secretary Ross to get that done by the end of this year. So there's no way to sidestep the feds on this? I mean, it seemed to me that one, the thing, we're all waiting for the feds. Isn't there a way to just sort of say, this is, what, you know, this is our state's rights, this is what we want to do, this is the law we're going to enact, and put the onus on the feds, which we know they'll go in with troops and stuff and whatever but the point is i we well, i always thought we were kind of backward on that and that why don't we enact our own laws and then make the feds uh respond perhaps there's a lack of political courage political which what is it political courage amongst uh -huh. our representatives both at the state level and even more so at the federal level and it stands in the way of, of such actions but you suggest that uh, that uh, has been prepared for for a number of years, like you say, but there just isn't quite enough numbers of legislators that are willing to go out on the limb and defy the federal government, as far as I can tell. That's right, and, and what, what folks bring up is this conflict with federal law. They talk about putting our Vermont farmers at risk because of that conflict, that if they were to grow hemp per um, state law and, and the state permitting process, they would still be in conflict with federal law. And, but it does come down exactly, Larry, I completely agree, to political courage. I mean, a good example is the whole GMO right to know bill that was going through the, the, the works uh, this year as well. And basically having that political courage to stand up for your rights as a state against the federal government and against the threats that might be made by, in the GMO case, you know, the, the industry, um, threats of lawsuits. And, and it boils down to the legislators themselves and state employees being at risk of, of uh, criminal prosecution. So, Now, if, if their concern, though, is that we can uh, hurt our farmers, that's kind of, particularly since we already know that there are farmers really in places around the country who would be more than willing to say, okay, you know, let's do it, you know, and the risk is mine not the state okay. legislatures. Any, do, you have, do you have anybody like that, which we can euphemistically call guinea pigs? <laughs> we, we do, I mean, we, we at Vote Hemp personally know several uh, Vermont farmers that are ready and willing to grow hemp is as, the state soon, as soon as they get that state permit. Is the state decision-making apparatus aware of that? They are somewhat, but we, unfortunately what happened with the amendment this, this session was this all came about at the last minute. So. There was very little time for public hearings. There was very little time for uh, testimony. And, and, and then there was a lot of contentious uh, uh, fighting going on uh, within the legislature at the last minute and deals were being made. And so 
this got sort of caught up in that process. So I think next year, we're certainly going to continue pushing forward and have the time um, and, and opportunities to make, make those points and, and get testimony from farmers, uh, which we did at the beginning of this, uh, this amendment process. Okay, you know, let's of, also then examine what, can, what, what, what happens when you suppress hemp as a, as a product. Um, Larry's experience, I think, is, a, is, is really one of the stronger local experiences here about when hemp is illegal, does that, 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 that has a chain reaction that affects things down the consumer line. Well, I mean, that's a slightly different topic. To me, one of the things that's most integral to the entire national discussion on industrial hemp um, has more to do with the lack of potential and seriousness with which the individuals in the country take it seriously. If you polled people in Wyndham County now, and I have seen thousands and thousands of people over the 14 years that my store was there, and most of them went away better educated about industrial hemp, the uses, the history, than when they walked in the store. Um, thousands of them received for free information on uh, the value of hemp. But uh, if you ask them, well, what are the pressing needs uh, of our community now? Uh, something like Vermont Yankee would be way up at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's not an important and passionate issue for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I think the greater value to our society would be to take some of that energy that individuals have, that place that energy into working on campaigns like Vermont Yankee and others, and recognize how valuable and what potential this has for all aspects of our life here in the United States, not just our economy, uh, our health, uh, our entire agricultural system. Uh, it, it's amazing what the potential is, and I'm a little surprised that people haven't found it to be more of a serious topic for them. I think that uh, I found a lot of customers that feel really good about having come in and bought something that was organic or made out of hemp or a hemp blend. Uh, but even few of them recognize the necessary grassroots effort that could only lead to better response from our educators and from our representatives all the way up the chain. And it's going to take more grassroots effort than just activists like Eric working at the state and federal level because there's not a groundswell uh, of, of support. Uh, and you'd almost imagine there would be, or I would have imagined by now there would be. It's coming, but I think it needs more uh, on the ground uh, support. Right, and, and, and to that point, Vote Hemp, which started about 12 years ago, the spring of 2000, a big part of our, our uh, mission in the first place, of course our overall mission is to, is to change the laws, help, help get the laws changed here in the U.S. so our farmers can grow, grow hemp again. That's our overall mission, but uh, we, we have sort of a, a multi-pronged approach to that. Um, there's a, a media and PR element, there's a direct lobbying element, and we engage at the state and federal level in that respect, but a big part of this also is grassroots pressure and us doing what we can as an organization, an advocacy organization, to facilitate the, the, the growth of that grassroots pressure because we've always thought that over time we've been a little less, uh, less and less confident about the, uh, the, the, the chances of, of things changing at the federal level on their own. And building that grassroots pressure up through the states and, and, and progressive states like Vermont, North Dakota on this issue moving forward. And that's why it's so important that Vermont continue to move forward with our, our work here and, and get to the point where we can li license farmers, because that sends a collective message to the federal government. And that's what I think Larry's talking about here is, is that they need to understand that this is a, a wide, widely supported grassroots issue. That well, most you know, but you, you have polls that maybe can reflect that and maybe not. The truth is, it seems to me that, you know, Larry's right on the mark. What we're really missing is a 60-ish type of 
say, stand up and, and take this issue mm -hmm. from the what, and I hate to use this term, bottom-up type thing, or where you think the broadest base is, you know, up to the narrow uh, base of the th of the feds, which is which is uh, they're really out of touch with that narrow base. Um, Marijuana Resolve was formed. Uh, because Daryl and I decided that there were plenty of groups who already did lobbying, who, uh, who worked by email list and things like that. What we wanted to do was to take um, a lot of these messages directly to the people. Uh, I think we may be one of the groups, I don't know if there are very many of them, who have shows like this in public access that is meant to reach the public like that. The other thing that we've done is held events and so on. So. Um, like last year, we were involved with the, with Hemp History Week um, also. Yeah. Um, both uh, plants affect one another. Both plants are commonly confused, um, and uh, so by by getting this out uh, to the to the public, I, I've been in your store, save the corporations from themselves, a number of times when I was in there when when somebody would come in and you could see them handling the hemp. Uh, uh, shirts and pants and other things that you had there and you could and there were oftentimes spontaneous conversations that would just come from the discussion of of purchasing from your store not to mention the activist attic that you had uh, upstairs um, and so um, locally that was really one of our top line uh, public outreach was was uh, was Larry's store um, so you know uh, let's hope that we can, and I hope you're right about that. You see a groundswell um, taking place. Well, I'm exaggerating that I see it. It's more that it still seems inevitable as each year goes by that there is indeed a growing awareness of the value of industrial hemp and more and more uh, support for it at every level of life. Uh, I would like to see a state like Vermont at the local level uh, start to enact its own legislation with regards to industrial hemp in order to put pressure on the state where the state has come up a little short because of the fear of what action the federal government might take. I think that's a bit of a disingenuous fear to drum up sort of worry that somehow or another our farmers uh, would be devastated by right. a federal government attack or raid. I don't buy that. I think that right. uh, if medical marijuana growers are for the most part being left alone. I certainly think uh, a well-controlled uh, industrial hemp program would be completely left alone. And I would ask individuals in communities to consider petitions, whether they be non-binding petitions or even local ordinances that really speak to this issue uh, at a small town level that can then percolate up to those very legislatures that are not quite ready to defy the federal government, maybe that push is what they need. Well, in this state, Eric, that's a great idea. Uh, maybe that's something we could work on. I agree with that. I was just going to say, let's you know continue that particular discussion, the three of us, uh, um, soon because I, you know, Vote Hemp as a, as a national organization has not done a lot of work on the local level. We typically focus on the state and federal level, although we have helped certain communities write resolutions or create petitions so we, we you know we can certainly assist in that and we do a lot of outreach and again grassroots development so uh, that that is something I think that in a state like Vermont where we're sort of teetering on the edge of breaking through on this that's you know an important part of the strategy and I and I totally uh, agree that's a great idea to and as you know marijuana kind of holds things back for hemp it's one of the reasons why vote hemp made the um, strategic decision to kind of keep the issue separate mm -hmm. the truth is no matter how much you struggle to do that they're really not you keep coming back mm -hmm. and you're facing marijuana right. so marijuana resolve who where we started out from the beginning with grassroots type uh, um, input with uh, both hemp and marijuana you know, we, we'd like to continue that. Not that we're against different groups doing different things, but that, but that we, we really see the need for all of us to work together on that. So um, if you're, you know, at some point down the road, we can talk more about that process. Um, we're gonna have some activity over the summer 
and we're going to have you guys back uh, anyway for more of this because this discussion as we're going into 013 it should be impactful enough that by the time January of next year comes um, all of us have kind of gotten even more word there and and a petition process this year would be something we'd be willing to help on mm -hmm. great great of any kind however however it comes out whether as Larry said non-binding or, or or it's a local ordinance or, or anything like that Brattleboro is a great area to start with absolutely I agree and, and, um, and every, you know every community might want to approach it Definitely. That's there's, right, there's and Burlington, of course, do. which is much larger, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, could be involved, um, and so that that's you know, we can look to, to yeah. that. And that would be great to have that, like you said, leading up into next year and the next legislative uh, session, right? So that we can have that that building of uh, support, that growing support, to then bolster the efforts we make. That's right. You know, we're, we're not year. really. Uh, antagonistic to the legislature we you know all of us really understand that we that we really need to work uh, with these people and are very willing to do that but what we really need is a lot more uh, genuine genuine interest not as Larry said disingenuous uh, fear of farmers being hurt that we you know so let's work on how do we get them past that. It's not a homeland security issue. It's not hemp is not a, a drug issue, um, and I think it's that 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 it's not a hemp is not a threat to the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Vermont. Uh, why? What's you know what is the holdup um, up there? Well, one interesting thing I think is happening. I don't have accurate statistics, but my sense is is that more and more people in the U.S. are purchasing hemp items right. uh, from across the board, whether they be nutritional products, uh, cosmetic products, uh, clothing right. products. And yet, I have a sense that a lot of those people have taken for granted the access that they do have currently as sufficient for their needs. I can go online, I can see 15 different hemp purveyors of various different types. I can pick and choose, I can order, I can afford it, it gets mailed to me, I'm wearing it, I feel good, and that's just okay with me. That doesn't interfere with my time or energy to do other things. Unfortunately, it doesn't help grow the movement towards right. fully recognizing and legalizing the growing of industrial hemp. And I think those people, and you're right, that the industry has been growing. Uh, the, the, the Hemp Industries Association, uh, which is a trade group, uh, Vote Hemp is a sister organization of the HIA, and, and that organization tracks the growth of the industry through surveys and, and point of sale data um, on, on certain uh, products um, in stores, et cetera. And so these are estimates, but, but the, the industry, the last numbers that came out were for 2010, and it was about a $419 million industry. And so that's been steadily seeing, depending on which category you're looking at, you know, 10 to 20% growth uh, per year. So 400 plus million dollar industry now is, is, that's a substantial. is getting, you know, becoming substantial. But now. if that growing industry is uh, also a block towards not acting on a grassroots level because they're content, with doing that, that's bad news. Uh, right, and I, and I wanted to you know, make the point that, so these folks, you know, more and more of whom are buying hemp products and, and uh, buying more of them, still don't necessarily feel or, or make that connection between that shirt or that, uh, that cereal, granola, and the farmer that grew the hemp that went into it. And, and, and like a lot of products, I mean, we have the same issue with with, with all sorts of stuff being made in China these days. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, more so are thinking about where their products come from. But it's the same, it's the same issue. It's someone not thinking of beyond the product. And how did it get to me? What's the carbon footprint? What's been involved? What types of environmental hazards might have been encountered? You know, where did, this, where did these raw materials get grown? And so that, you know, somehow... You know, it, it's again just that that awareness, that grassroots efforts to build up people's concern about these things and to ask these questions and and think about where these things are coming from and, and you know what would the impact be if that 400 plus million dollars of hemp was being grown by American farmers 
and not Canadian or Chinese. And we have farmers. two. Uh, we have two decades of having uh, outsourcing, so that we have American consumers who are who are who are accustomed to turning to gather products from China, Mexico, and things like that. This is a tough thing. This is a tough call to overcome that kind of a, a, of a situation. Right. Maybe we can talk about drug testing also because, uh, you know, hemp and drug testing. Um, you know, isn't there a connection uh, to the outlawing of hemp that's that's literally tied in tight with uh, drug testing. And so it's not just that, and and that relates to the consumer uh, purchases because a lot of them are uh, products that you consume. You either use oils, hemp oils on your body. You can eat hemp powder and things like that. So is how do you can 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 you guys give us uh, any any of your thoughts on that? Well, the 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 DEA's efforts uh, back around. 2000, late 99, 2000, the DA made some, some serious efforts to ban hemp foods and probably hemp body care would have been banned as well. And this was them going through a, a reinterpretation of the Controlled Substances Act as it relates to hemp because this was a, the hemp industry was starting to, 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 to grow and it was showing up on, on their radar. And they said, hey, you know, what are we going to do about this? Well, simple thing would be for us to reinterpret the CSA as it applies to this new emerging product, hemp. The Controlled Substance Act. Yep, and, and essentially what, what they were trying to do is write, rewrite that interpretation <clears throat> to say that if, if a product, a food or body care product, ended up resulting in any amount of THC, parts per million, any amount, entering the human body, then that would be considered a drug Schedule one narcotic, like marijuana is, and those products would therefore be uh, deemed illegal. Even though that amount would not have any effect. Well, and I bring this up because right. you, you, you mentioned the, the drug testing industry. Right. And so that, that was really the impetus right. of this whole effort on the DEA's part. Uh, we believe the drug testing industry was raising red flags and probably encouraging the DEA to do this. Uh, and so... So that was, that was sort of where this all came from. Now, long story short, the industry, uh, the HIA that I mentioned before, the Hemp Industries Association, sued the federal government. That lawsuit went through, through the process. Uh, we won. It was appealed by the, by the federal government, uh, Department of Justice. We won the appeal. They decided not to appeal it to the Supreme Court. And so about 10 years ago, 9, 10 years ago, um, you know that that problem of the DEA potentially outlawing outlawing hemp these, these hemp food and body care products yeah. went away because of that lawsuit. But again, the the workings behind that, the motivations, we're pretty sure oh, most of that came out of the drug testing industry. Now, the drug testing industry dealt with this issue with poppy seeds. Um, some people love poppy seed bagels, uh, pound cake, uh, muffins. A lot of people eat poppy seeds, and poppy seeds have trace amounts of opiates. So um, basically what they did, very simply, they raised the thresholds of the drug tests. That's how they accommodated the fact people were eating foods that might result in a little bit of opiates in their body. So same thing could have been done with, uh, with, with hemp, obviously, very simple solution. But the DEA you know, was insisting that they needed to rewrite the interpretation and, and basically ban these products. So luckily that didn't happen and we can now go buy hemp foods at our local stores. Well, Larry, we have about a minute if you'd like to add anything to that. Uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion because it's not going to get wrapped up in a tidy little sound bite here. Right. I would encourage folks in the sound of my voice or being able to access this show around Vermont to uh, pause and consider a little bit more uh, what they could do uh, in a small amount of their time and to remind folks, young and old, of the value of industrial hemp and how it is not taken for granted that this will ever become legalized and receive the potential that it has without everyone making an effort. Exactly. In our next program, Daryl Pillsbury will return. Uh, he had uh, some uh, personal issues that he had to take care of today and couldn't be here, but uh, thank you once again for watching Marijuana Resolve. And on behalf of Daryl and myself, 
Uh, we'd like to thank Larry Block and Eric Lineback for bringing on the show. And as Larry said, we will continue this conversation. You'll hear more from us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Welcome. Far from our star, but no place better.